This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, host of the original Southern Remedy, the show where I answer your medical questions. Subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on any podcasting app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Deep South Dining, the show all about the culture of Southern flavor and the good folks that love to stir the pot. Good morning, Malcolm White with Carol Palmer. We will be your host this morning. The South has a flavor profile that really sets it apart from other parts of the country. Chef Ernest Fondas is combining those flavors with ingredients from the South Pacific to create dishes for his New Orleans restaurant, Sui Generous. Also, with fresh ingredients, he grows on his farm and food lab in Purlington, Mississippi. Good morning. It's Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. It's Mardi Gras time. We're in Mardi Gras mode and yes, mood. It's Mardi Gras mumbo mumbo. Good morning, Carol. How in the world are you? Oh, Mal, I'm good. It, it was a tough week last week with the, the cold, yeah, but I'm yeah. good. We, we all were sort of whipped around and beat up. Yeah, we were. Uh, so, yeah, I, de- I dealt with loss of um, a whole heating unit uh, on our first floor of our house. Also, hot water off and on. And then down at the Hallam Owls at the restaurant, we blew out our fire extinguisher system yesterday afternoon and had to shut it down oh, and rebuild it. Gosh. But, you know, it's always something. Now, it you, is. You, you, okay. You, I had what you got? It, it go away Lodge. The heat went out, so we stayed in the 20-degree weather with no heat until we could get out well. through the ice. Then came to the house in Jackson, and the ceiling literally fell in. Hot water pipes broke, so... I've been a gypsy woman. I think it's fair to say that we are unequipped for winter. Uh, yes, indeed. Here in the, uh, this region of the state. Java, you got any uh, weather uh, so updates? you have any disasters? Well, see, un- unfortunately, I didn't get the worst of it like you guys. I know I'm, I've, I'm sorry for you guys. But, Thank you, I mean, Java. you know, it was just kids at home. If that's a struggle <laughs> for all my parents, they know what I, they know what I mean. But yeah, other than that, it was it was pretty okay on on my end. So we just hunkered down, made soup, and uh, dealt with. I it. knew there was a pot of soup. There on were your multiple stove. pots of soup mm-hmm. at my house. I made this uh, pork and bean soup with a pork tenderloin and some white beans. It was really good. Uh, I wish there had been a drone between Edwards. <laughs> I could have and shipped you some. <laughs> and Kara made a beautiful apple cake, which I brought you a slug of. Both of you this morning, we have a chance. Enjoy that. Take we it home. love it when she bakes. She bakes, and, and we eat. She also made a, a really nice lasagna, which is a, a good thing to have in the refrigerator when you're sort of homebound or sort of homebound. Anyway. That's what we were cooking and eating. What about you? you well, as you were a refugee running I here was, in your Yes, home? A, a refugee. But <clears throat> Friday night, uh, I had the pleasure of dining at Helen Mal's in the Red Room. Yeah. And it, uh, it was with the supper club that John and I are members of. And you couldn't believe the excitement of the people that we were going to Helen Mal's. A lot of this group had had never been there, and Damien Kavicki, the chef, cooked right. for us. Yep. Interestingly, Jeff and Debbie Good were the host. And wow, yeah. for those who don't know Jeff, he is uh, a local restaurateur and owns several restaurants here. And it was just wonderful that he chose Hal and Mal's and chose to showcase uh, Chef Damien's work. That is nice. Um, so Mary Sanders and, and Damian Kavicki, who now own and operate Howl and Mouse, are doing lots of interesting things like hosting dinner parties and having special dinners. That Every room was full. Yeah. There was yeah. A, you know, a, wedding, a wedding supper in one, rehearsal dinner. I mean, it was, it was really rocking. But you know, Jeff just told him, just said, you know, feed us. Right. And didn't really know what the menu was going to be, just left it in his hands. And the first course was butternut ravioli 
Yeah. With pecan brown butter. Malcolm, it was delicious. Very good. I could have just. That, you could have wrapped that. it up right there. I could have right wrapped there. it up. Mm-hmm. But I, I wanted to talk about the second course. It was a green chili braised pork shoulder. Mm. And, it, you know, it was shredded. And it had uh, a tamale cornbread dressing under it. It was absolutely delicious. He, he's doing some great stuff. And then. They have Campbell's Bakery. Right. And Which they a, also own and operate yes, in Fondren. And for a favor, he gave each of us a baby king cake, and I brought it. I'm sorry that we can't show these things, but is that not the cutest thing you've ever seen? It's it's a beautiful, round, tricolored, sparkly, hopefully gooey and well it's very gooey it it has a filling it has you know it it sliced in half and has a filling yes it is Mm -hmm. delicious and um i just love all the different things people are doing with king cakes well i was going to say this about king cakes you know our guest today is chef ernest fondas who is operates lives and operates out of new orleans and hancock county which is you know about hancock county we say the coast is is made up of two counties and a parish, and we call Hancock <laughs> County a parish. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, when I was growing up and working in New Orleans in the 70s, the king cake really didn't get outside of the Mobile, New Orleans sort of area. And now it's really moved north. I mean, it Hattiesburg, Jackson, it's become a very regional thing. In fact, we have a piece of king cake here in the studio. Also, besides the one from Campbell's Bakery, we have a slice from Broad Street. I uh, mean, whoever has seen a slice, a restaurant survey slice of king cake? Individual, I love it. individual survey. I think that's great because Java. What did you tell us before we went on? Oh yeah, I said I'm, I'm past the stage of my life where I need a whole king cake. I, I'm, I'm, I'm past that. I'm past that point. But I do need the king cake to help celebrate the season. So a slice will do me just. An individual serving will do me just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Because it yeah. gets dangerous if you put the whole king cake out there. It's just, a lot of dough, Java. I mean, we we in carnival. We in Mardi Gras. It's just <laughs> I, it, it's there. I may mean, take the whole thing down. <laughs> so I like the concept of the baby king cake right, that right. I have here, and Java's nice. It's more than a slice. I would say it's a chunk of chunk, king cake. Chunk of king cake. Well, either way, it is the season. Mardi Gras is uh, February, a uh, fat Tuesday, February thirteenth. Celebrations have already started. It is the season, and uh, the king cake, uh, as I said, is, is moving outside of of uh, the Crescent City and is becoming more omnipresent uh, all throughout this region. And of course, we had uh, Robert St. John on a few weeks ago, and he talked. At, at length about the king cakes that they make uh, at the Loblolly Bakery there that he and Martha Foos and, uh, Donald, and Bender. Donald Bender are running and operating. And there's been a lot of social media activity for those of us who follow them about their king cake. And Robert talked a lot about his favorite king cake and sort of trying to get it right, trying to learn to make them. Yeah, he's not a big fan of ultra sweet. Mm-hmm. He's... Uh, He's looking for that special place in between, in between sweet and doughy. I got He's you. looking for the umami. Now, we also, speaking of Jeff Good, we had Jeff on recently, and uh, he talked about his version of the history of the king cake and sort of what they do at Broad Street Bakery. So, you know, um, the winter, winter solstice, is the shortest day of the year, the least amount of light. Pagan society would um, celebrate the death of the crop and the rebirth of the crop on that shortest day. And uh, Saturn was the, the god of agriculture, and so Saturnalia was was the pagan holiday that happened during the, the uh, late December the 21st. The early Christian church in the 3rd and 4th century, in order to, for, to be able to continue to grow the Christian church, you know, a lot of the pagan rituals were folded in and, and brought forth. And so the idea of this from dark to light, holiday became Christmas. So it was tagged to be the birth of, of Jesus Christ and the, the idea of Christ's light coming into the world. So the darkest night going into the growing light. And then the whole idea of the 12 days of Christmas, you know, uh, the New Testament tells us that, that uh, after the birth of, of Christ, 12 days later, the three wise men arrived. And so that 12 days later is January the 6th, which is Epiphany. And Epiphany is the 
uncovering of the baby Jesus, the, the bringing of the light of the world into the world. And so that is a, um, the beginning of carnival season. So then carnival celebration rolls until Mardi Gras. And Mardi Gras is going to be 40 days before Easter. So the calendar set, you set Easter, you go back 40 days, and you're going to have Ash Wednesday. You're going to have Mardi Gras the day before. And, and that is the festival of debauchery. So, you know, in the Middle Ages. Uh, fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday, mm-hmm. Tuesday Mardi Gras. In, in, in the Middle Ages, um, this was a time where uh, common folk were able to run the city for, for a day. <laughs> they would have parties and, and dress in fine uh, you know, in fits, and they would crown a king or queen uh, for the day uh, from the common folks, and they would be able to be uh, the fool for the day, the king or queen. How do they choose that? Well, they had a cake that had a bean baked into it, and whoever got that bean would be able to be the king yeah. for the day. And uh, out of all that, the, the outfits, the, the masks, the, the, the garb, the balls, all of that kind of moved into what we know as carnival season with the cruise and everything in New Orleans. And then um, I think that, that um, from there, it, 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 when you take a look at the, the history of that in the, in, in the lens of, of, of current time, it's fascinating to see how history and food intersect because now the king cake represents – uh, the crown of Jesus, royalty. You've got the three colors, which is purple for justice, uh, gold for power, and green for faith. And uh, instead of a bean, uh, there's a little baby in there now, and that's supposed to be re- representing the baby Jesus. And no, no king cake manufacturer puts the baby in the, the cake any longer in the United States because we're afraid somebody's going to gag on it. So we put it on top, and we let you do that. And, of course, the idea of the... Of the baby and the cake is if you ha- take a king cake to a party, whoever gets a slice with a, a baby has to buy the king cake the next time. That's our friend Jeff Good <clears throat> from Broad Street Bakery, uh, Bravo, and Sally Mookie's here in Jackson. A, a, a wonderful human being. And uh, I think you can go back and podcast and listen to that entire show with Jeff Good. I don't know exactly what the date was, but Java, you can tell them how they can uh, listen to that entire interview. Yeah, go and subscribe to the podcast, Deep South Dining, wherever you get your podcast or your audio or download the MPB public media app. I believe that episode was actually from last year. It was Jeff Good, um, Elaine Trigiani, um, Joe Sherman. And Malcolm White. It was the A team. Carol <laughs> was Carol not? I think Carol. No. I think Carol was oh, out. Oh my goodness! I yeah. did not realize that. <laughs> and also Robert St. John's show of a week or so, two weeks ago. I don't know how long ago it was. He talked a lot about king cakes and the Vietnamese who are baking these fabulous king cakes in New Orleans. You can podcast that show as well. And uh, hear more about the Mardi Gras and the king cake and the history therein. Uh, We are talking uh, about Mardi Gras because we've sort of been digging around the king cake. But uh, at this point in time, we want to welcome uh, to the show uh, uh, someone that I've heard a lot about. Um, I hear my friends in Hancock County and Bay St. Louis talking about Chef Ernest all the time. And I've seen some stuff uh, on social media about the Tiki Farm and the Food Lab that he uh, operates in Purlington, Mississippi, uh, but now we want to welcome him to the show, Chef Ernest, and uh, thank you for joining us, sir. Thanks, Mal- <clears throat> Thanks, Malcolm. It's good to be here. Absolutely. So you, you heard the previous conversation about king cakes, and, and since you live there uh, in New Orleans, you might do you have any comments or, or anything you'd like to add to that conversation? I do, actually, yeah. Um, I mean, we all love king cakes, um, but it fits in actually with my zero waste model because last year, for example, we were we had a, a really beautiful king cake from Don Fong, and it was Ash Wednesday, so we we're finished with Mardi Gras, and I was sitting there, you know, in the aftermath of Mardi Gras, looking at half of the king cake left over, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I need to do something with that because zero waste cooking is what I do, so I decided to turn the king cake into a miso which is very unusual. So I mixed it with soybeans, mixed it with koji, salt, and water, and fermented it till today. So uh, oh my. It start, yeah, it was really interesting. And it started off strange because, you know, you can make miso out of anything, but I hadn't made miso out of something that has um, yeast in it. So for the first few months, it started to really off-gas and create a lot of pressure in ferment, and that was interesting. So I wasn't sure if it was going to really work, but after a few months, it started to become beautiful and floral with an amazing umami flavor. 
So now this year we're about to make a king cake miso king cake. So it'll be stuffed with the last piece <laughs> king cake that we turned into miso. So that is zero waste in its essence, Man. right? Yeah. Malcolm, I'm so glad you asked that question. That's radical, and I love it. Um, <laughs> that is, is miso so king cake. Now making a king cake out of the miso king cake. That's right. So that's what you do, Chef. Right? That's what that's what I do. Yeah. Well, we like I want to start that. before what you do about miso king cake. You are indeed a lawyer, correct? Yes, that's correct. And do you still practice law as well as make miso out of king cake? I do. I pretty much worked simultaneously as a chef and a lawyer for many, many years. There's now, a story behind that. Too. Yeah, please <laughs> yeah, share the story. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to start at the beginning here and take the audience on the journey. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I grew up around restaurants. Both of my grandparents had restaurants in Boston. My parents were from Boston. Um, I was born in New Orleans and growing up around um, in the Garden District, around the Brennan's children, a couple of them. We would hang out in Commander's Palace, just going through, you know how you go to the, you have to walk through the kitchen to go to the courtyard. So when I was a kid, I would walk through the kitchen to go to the courtyard, and um, Paul Perdome was the chef. So I would be kind of amazed by just seeing him do his prep, and he started showing me different techniques, like, for example, how to make a roux, how to make oysters Rockefeller, things of that nature. And I was amazed, first, at his... Uh, benevolence in showing a young kid how to cook and then just in the whole cooking process. So I, I was hooked right away at a young age. And as soon as I could start working in restaurants, I did that. Then I went to college in Boston. I was working um, at a restaurant as a line cook, um, Jasper's. And my chef asked me what my long-term goals were. And I told him, you know, I want to have a restaurant with an always changing menu. And he said, well, first of all, that's impossible. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, that's what I want to do because I, I find it, you know, less interesting to cook the same thing every week. It seems like minimizing waste and cooking whatever's fresh every week, week to week, makes more sense. And he was like, okay, well, that's a crazy concept, but, you know, that's fine. Then I said, and I'm also thinking of either going to culinary school or graduate school. And I explained, you know, I've been working in restaurants for a long time. A lot of them with really amazing concepts, but I, they would go out of business because they weren't run right on the business side. So he said, OK, well, stop right there. If you want to have an unusual concept restaurant, you should probably go to graduate school, not culinary school. You already know how to cook. Go to graduate school, make money. And if you can get a job making money, you can be a catering chef on the side. And then eventually you can be your own investor, because if you have a lawyer or a businessman and doctor investor, they're going to end up cutting your creativity you know, not allowing you free reign to have an always changing menu. So that's basically what I did. I ended up going to law school and being a catering chef on the side. And uh, I met Adrian in Philadelphia. She's my, my business partner and partner. And we bought a building in New Orleans, moved back to New Orleans, bought the building, opened the restaurant. And I also represent a lot of bars and restaurants on that side as well, because I know the business on both ends. I can I like to say I'm the only attorney that can also hold down the saute stage. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. it. <laughs> if you if you can't trust me, who can you trust? That's a great exactly. calling card for this business. Absolutely. So where do your South Pacific and South Asian influences come from? That's a good question. Um, so Adrian and I like to travel. Uh, we also like cooking influences from around the world. Um, so every year we, we close for a week or two in um, – in the for Fourth of July and usually for Thanksgiving. Then we travel around the world and we pre-schedule visits with chefs in different countries. So we started doing that in the South Pacific just because we like tropical weather. We like snorkeling, coconuts, <laughs> coconut crabs, <laughs> things of that nature. So we um, did several trips to Tahiti, Vanuatu, um, Fiji, different places. And we were completely hooked. We love it. We also love the whole sort of 1950s tiki culture, both in the exotica music and um, in in the, the you know the whole the whole style of it, the whole aesthetic of it. So that's basically what got us hooked on it. And um, we visited a farm in Fiji on one of our trips, and we were blown away by what this couple was doing. It was called the um, Gaia Farm, and 
we on basically after we visited the farm, we were like, all right, we need some of these ingredients because we always seek unusual ingredients for the weekly changing menu. And you know, we've got a lot of great local farmers in New Orleans. They kind of all have the same stuff. So we thought if we can actually bring some of those ideas back and actually implement them, it would be amazing. So after the trip, really on the flight back, we started talking about what we could do to build a little farm. So we first started looking in the neighborhood in Bywater. Properties were really expensive. Dirt was you know, terrible. And then we started looking a little further out. So as we started looking further out, we decided maybe it would be great to have a place that we could eventually turn into a, a venue to have special events or catering you know, parties, maybe even classes and things of that nature. We came across the property in Purlington and we were, we were shocked. As soon as we walked onto that property, we knew that that was the property we needed to buy. Um, it had basically been a foreclosure since Katrina. Right. And, you know, Burlington was ground zero for Katrina. So it didn't have any, any businesses coming in, no investment. So the bank was very, uh, had a very good price. So we got the property at an amazing price. And that's where it all started. So we brought sort of that aesthetic of Tiki to Burlington. So we call it the... Uh, SG Tiki Farm. So SG is for Sui Generous, which is our restaurant, and the SG Tiki Farm. And that's about six years ago. We started just gradually building it up, planning things, and uh, putting in infrastructure. Did the farm come before the restaurant? I know the restaurant opened in 2012, right? Uh, yeah, the, the restaurant came first. So the, the farm's about six years old, the restaurant's about 12 years old. Yeah. And so Talk to us time. about the name Sui Generous. Yeah. So um, way back when we first bought the building, it was 2002. And uh, we actually got the liquor license when we bought the building, even though we still lived in New York. So we were going to originally call the restaurant the Huey. And um, in the meantime, before we were able to open, another restaurant called Huey's 24-7 ended up opening. And so we decided we couldn't call it that because we didn't want to be you know, too closely associated with the other business. And so Adrian started doing some research. We were going to call it the Huey in part because of Hugh Long. Hugh Long, you know, famous character in Louisiana history. He brokered some deals in the bars around, you know, the Bywater area. Right. Um, and she came up with the, she figured out that he used to call himself Sui Generous. And sui generis is also a legal term, so it's kind of it's kind of apropos from from my business background too, and it means case of first impression or um, uh, item that hasn't been determined yet or one of a kind. So we decided that because our menus are essentially one of a kind every week, week after week, sui generis made sense. So in the restaurant, you're doing what you're the chef told you you could not do, which is change the menu every week. That's right. Yeah, we've done over 500 distinct menus since we've been in business. So um, I find that it really, it opens the doors to creativity because you use what, what's available and you use what's on hand. So for example, if I do something with, let's say corn, when we make a mag chu with corn, we're going to have a whole bunch of corn husks and corn cobs. So then what I'll do is I will take the corn cobs and I'll turn it into corn cob dashi because corn cobs make an incredible dashi. Um, and we will do an Asian soup the next week. So really, if you commit to it, it opens up doors to creativity and unusual flavor pairings, which is really what I'm going for. How does the menu start? Is it the morning? In, in the morning you go to the market or... What's the birth of the menu? So the birth of the menu is the menu from the week before and what's available at the farm. So basically the way it works is we're open at the restaurant Friday through Sunday right now. We've reduced our hours since COVID. Um, so Monday night we do our chef meeting. Uh, and then Monday night is when, well, Monday day, I start to gather uh, what we've got available from our farm, what we have available maybe like odds and ends in the freezer, things from the last menu, our various ferments, pickles, different things like that. And at the meeting Monday night is when we come up with the menu for the week. And then we start to acquire the ingredients and, and prep for Friday, which is when the new menu comes up. So what is grown at the farm? 
I, I'm of course it's seasonal. You're in that sort of semi-tropical climate down there. You've got better dirt in Purlington than you do in New Orleans, but it's not the greatest dirt. I think it's sandy loam, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it's sandy with a lot of clay. So for the first couple of years, we started planting things by digging holes. And, you know, the trees, the bushes, uh, they didn't grow very well. And then we realized that what we were doing is we were we were creating an environment for root rot because if you dig a hole in, in heavy clay, you're creating a bowl. Right. And then water sits in the bowl and it rots your roots. So then your, your trees and plants don't grow. A lot of people ask me, how come your trees are growing and mine don't in, in you know, like that Burlington area? And the answer is because you have to you have to build a mound. So if you plant a tree on a mound, the roots will grow and they'll penetrate the clay, but there won't be a pocket that creates, you know, water that will rot the roots. So we started building up our mounds. So throughout the farm, we've got mounds, uh, raised beds. I also have a greenhouse that we have trees. So in our greenhouse, we've got mangoes, jackfruit, strawberry fruit tree, um, edamoya, uh, vanilla, dragon fruit, star fruit, peppers, all kinds of amazing things. Vanilla beans. These are in. These are all in the hothouse, greenhouse. Yes. And so, so for, how tall yeah. are the mounds? When you say you, you build up these mounds, I know a lot of people build boxes and grow things uh, above yeah. ground, but you, you've come up with the mound theory. So yeah, it's called Udula culture. It's a it's a German origin um, way to build mounds. So what you do basically is you do layers. So it's like it's also called it can be called lasagna gardening. So first what I do is I weed out the, um, the grass because, you know, in our region, we've got that the torpedo grass and those runner grasses that are extremely dominant. So what I, would, what I do is I first weed that out to, to at least get rid of that. Then I'll put down cardboard to help keep the grass down. And then you start layering layers of twigs, uh, leaves. Leaves are really good because they build the bacteria and, right. you know, the chemical reactions in the grass. And then we start doing some pine needles. Uh, uh, ground up wood chips. We make our own mulch. So also one of the things we do is any vegetable. So my goal at the restaurant is zero waste. So we pickle, we ferment things at the end of the menu. And then anything that we have scrap wise vegetables, we'll bring them to the farm and we'll make compost. So then we start building our dirt. So then we use that to start building our mound. And our mounds end up being three to four feet tall. And then they, okay. they settle down and you have to keep adding soil to it. Because they slough, I guess. Yeah. They start to slough off. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, cool. Uh, yeah. Ernest, would you spell the German name of the type of agriculture this is? Or You know, that's... Let him very Google it real quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, while you're doing that, I want to tell our listeners that uh, I think it's this coming Saturday, Carol. Yes. January the 27th, Carol will be moderating a panel uh, at an event called Homegrown. It's in Hancock County, I believe, at the Hancock County Library in Performing the Performing Arts Center. Performing Hancock, Arts Center. Yeah, Hancock County Performing Arts Center. And you, you are going to moderate a panel. Yes. That includes. Ernest. Chef Ernest. And yes. others. And other, Martha cookbook. Foose and Vish. Chef Vish. Yes. Fish bot from Snack Bar in Oxford. Now, what if anybody is listening in that part of the world and they would like to attend this? Do, do you know any particulars? Well, is go, it in the um, morning? It, it's in the morning. It's either at 9 or 9.30. Okay. But if you go on uh, the website for the Hancock County Library System, okay. there is a, uh, a link to sign up, and there's more information. There's a schedule. Okay. Love to see. Now, Chef, you are going to be there, right? We didn't discuss this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be there (laughs) speaking, and I'm also going to set up a tent so I can show some people, show the people um, some ideas for zero waste and fermentation. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Now, did did you have have the spelling for uh, Hugel culture? Okay. It's H U G E L K U L T U R. Very complicated spelling. Okay, now, now, now I've got it. So, Hugel culture, Hugel culture, Hugel culture. 
very uh, interesting. Said. Well, I hear people, you know, talking about uh, permaculture and other ways of gro- of growing, and this sounds really interesting. Yeah, and it all fits together. So you can do permaculture on your hugel culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful. But yeah, I would. And it all is actually agriculture. I believe exactly it's many all cultures. cultures. <laughs> yeah, eating in general is culture too. So <laughs> right on. And our special guest today, Chef Ernest Fundus from New Orleans, uh, also of Purlington, where he has a tiki farm and food lab, and he has a restaurant in the Bywater called Sui Generous, and a law practice, and a law practice, and a record label. And the man is fascinating, and we're he welcome is, back, Chef. That's a, he's Leonardo <laughs> D. Fundus, yes, the Renaissance guy. So uh, we'll talk. I'm going to talk a little. Well, I want to talk about the zero waste and and the other things that you do. But before that, what do you do for Mardi Gras? What does Chef Ernest Mardi Gras look like? So it's a good question. It's evolved lately. We used to actually open the restaurant Mardi Gras Day, and we wouldn't. We wouldn't ask any of our employees to work. It would just be Adrian and myself. I would run the kitchen. She would run the bar. And we would do mostly go food, uh, you know, good Mardi Gras food, breakfast, kind of brunchy type of stuff. But since COVID, we we actually started going out to Mardi Gras. Yeah. <laughs> and we decided we like that even better. So <laughs> right now we're not open for Mardi Gras Day. But we live in Bywater. So basically there's a there's several marching clubs that end up forming on our block or within several blocks. So we just... You know, wake up, make a nice brunch on our balcony, watch the parades form, and then we just walk down there and follow one of the marching clubs and enjoy the day. Do you have a costume? Do you, Are you a character, or do you just get up and put on things that are lying around the house? So, good question. When when we would be open for in the restaurant, I would wear an Elvis outfit because I would <laughs> still order cook Elvis because, you know, that's pretty much what he's still doing since he's still alive. Of yeah. Course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's working over in Perlington, I think. I think he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, tell us, talk to us a little bit about Zero Waste and the concept uh, for a commercial kitchen, uh, a restaurant, if you would, and a farm. Right. So, you know, Zero Waste cooking, it it has its origin in mankind since the beginning of cooking. And we've gotten away from that because in restaurants, you know, we want to have a menu that's easy to execute where you have, you know, consistency and so you can save labor costs. So you can have less expensive people working that you can teach them each a specific task, right? So zero waste cooking kind of breaks the traditional mold where you're assessing your ingredients to use every part of each ingredient. And there's a term from Japan called kancha, and that means gratitude or thankfulness to your ingredients. Because in Japan, I, I I really like the the cooking and the respect nature of Japanese culture. And really the it it dates back to early days where you know people were really having to use every aspect of every ingredient to survive. And now we have the luxury of not doing that, but you know with food costs where they're going, it really needs to get back to that. I mean you you know Malcolm having a restaurant that food costs are crazy right now. So to the extent you can use every aspect of every ingredient, it really does make sense. So any, everything we get in, we, we assess it. So like, let's say it's a, a bell pepper. You know, typically we cut off the top and the bottom of the bell pepper, you cut out your ribs so you can use the, the, the perfect square rectangular parts to julienne and make, you know, pretty for presentation. And a lot of times you'll throw away those parts. But what we'll do is we'll assess it and we'll say, okay, this bell pepper has seeds. We're going to grow the seeds to make more bell peppers. We'll take the ribs and the tops and the bottoms. We'll make a sauce out of that. That's, you know, not the most revolutionary, you know, technique. But, you know, so we'll do that. And for every ingredient, that'll be the case. A lot of times, um, you know, we skin ingredients that the skin is really tasty, like carrots. Carrot skins are delicious and they're good for you. So you can take your carrot skins and you can turn that into carrot skin kimchi. You know, so there's a lot of things you can do to every ingredient to utilize it and transform it. You know, one of my favorite uh, vegetables uh, is the stalk of the broccoli. And I, I just, I see people throw it away and it just boggles the mind. Yeah. Yeah. Broccoli stalks are delicious. And, you know, oftentimes those are the parts 
of the ingredients that are even the best for you too. Mm. So another thing is like herb stems. Herb stems have a lot of uses. They can be they can be you know chopped down and used for cooking as well. They can be used to make stocks. You can use them to make compound oils. Um, also, like for example, you know pine trees. We all have pine trees in our backyards in this region. Um, pine needles are also a delicious ingredient. You, know, you can have pine shoots in the spring and you can use those in salads. But you can take pine needles and just steep them in olive oil. The green ones or when they turn brown? Green. Green, while, right they're, while green. they're still alive. Okay. Yeah. Well, go so, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Saute them in olive oil and then what? Saute them in olive oil and make a little pine oil and then that's a nice accent flavor. It can be bitter if you use too many. Uh, but, you know, a little bit of a bitter ingredient is really good for depth of flavor in, in any dish. Cool. I can't ask questions. I'm so busy making notes, writing down everything, <laughs> everything you say. I'm a composter, so um, this this is fascinating to me. Well, you're into uh, food evolution, uh, and I think on your logo, you, you sort of had a, have a evolutionary sort of brand. Talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, so I like to think of the way that we cook as we evolve dish to dish. Um, and not only in the processes that we use, but literally in the, the way that we use the ingredients. Because, you know, like I was saying, you, you use something on a current menu, and then you can make a stock out of it for the next menu, right. or, you know, freeze this, the stock that you make. Or you can ferment it, turn it into a miso, turn it into a soy sauce. Um, when we do, we, have, we always have vegan options on our menu. We have a lot of vegan people in, in the Bywater area. Right. And plus, it's a really good way to eat. Um, so we use tofu a lot, um, tempeh, we make our own tempeh, but like say, let's say for example, if we, we use tofu on a menu, we press our tofu and we're doing it on a stir fry at the end of the week, we might have, you know, um, three quarts of tofu left over. Then what I'll do is I'll turn the tofu into tofu roux, which is tofu cheese. And it's mm. the wow. best vegan cheese you will ever eat. It will Fo knock yourself. That's delicious sounding. Okay, yes. when is the cookbook coming? Yeah. So I'm working on the cookbook. Uh, <laughs> hopefully in the next year or so. It's going to be called Food Evolution. Uh, uh, of course. And it, it's basically, I have about 100 pages of it written, and I haven't even put any recipes in it yet. <laughs> well, you're way ahead of the game then. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. It's just, I'm just writing the stories. So basically the way I do it is when we go on vacation on the long airplane flights, uh -huh. I write the book. So that's basically the only you thing. obviously travel a lot for a guy who runs a law firm uh, and a farm uh, and a restaurant. Yeah, well, it's all about balance, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, time management. Time management. Life is uh, can be difficult. It's challenging. So you got to take the time to actually enjoy things occasionally, too. And like Adrian always tells me, if we don't go on vacation, I'll never take a break from doing all the things right, I you'll do. You'll just so, work all the time. Yeah, right, exactly. So I, I force myself to put it on the calendar and, you know set that time aside because we all need to do that. Correct. Java, you and I were talking earlier about uh, another aspect of Chef Ernest's uh, world, and that is Empire. This, <laughs> yeah, this, Chef, this, this, Chef Ernest the music piece. has a lot going on. And when I was on, um, uh, I think it was Twitter or Instagram on social media, I saw that in Sui Generous, there is a built-in DJ booth. And I was like, man, if your restaurant has a built-in DJ booth, then you got to know what's, you know, know what's going on. Is this true, Chef Ernest, that you are one of only two restaurants that have a record label? Yes. And the other one, the other one is um, Waffle House. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Waffle House Records? What? Uh, Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. The jukebox, the Waffle House jukebox. That's exactly Great it. Great company. So yeah, because Waffle House. I mean, House great has company food. for Sweet Generous and a yeah. great company. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. it's funny. We researched it because we thought we might be the only one, but then we came up with, we're like, Waffle House, really? But yeah, they have the jukebox, and so they have, you know, some songs. Um, so the, what happened with that is you know, we have a DJ booth, and one day this gentleman walked into the restaurant, Carlos Grasso, and he said, Hey, do you mind if I DJ during brunch? And I'm like, Yeah, sure. So he came in and he set up electronics. He makes these electronics himself, and they're all different types of distortion and um, 
different electronic uh, effects that he uses. And so he plays strange music. We cook strange food. So it kind of was a perfect pair. <laughs> <laughs> so he started doing that. And over time, we, you know, he came out to the farm and saw how beautiful it was. Um, he started recording nature sounds at the farm. And he knows that, you know, it, we're into the tiki aesthetic. So we decided it was his idea. He decided to start making an album. And so basically what it is, is it's a lot of the nature sounds from the farm and also construction sounds. Because when we built the food lab, there was a, you know, a crane that drove the piles. Right. And so we recorded that and that became percussion. So we used that and distorted that to create percussive sounds. And it's an album coming out. The band is called Pink Teddy Bear. And it's an album called Welcome to the Tiki Farm. And right. you can actually press it on vinyl. Are, so you, are you also a musician? I'm not a musician, but I am a DJ. Oh, you are a DJ. Well, you and, know Java's a DJ. Yeah, you, you oh. didn't know you were talking to DJ Java. Well, I'm going to have to talk to him about that. Yeah, you got to <laughs> get a gig. We'll all come down, and Carol and I will eat, and Java will DJ. We and may, that sounds great, Java. We, we may have do, we may have yeah. a plan. We may have a gig here. And I can I can bounce off, uh, is it uh, DJ Vermiculite and uh, DJ Jump Cut? There you go. Exactly. We can do a three DJ set. That would be fun. There you go. That's. I think we've got a gig here. <laughs> we, yeah, we've got it going you know? on. Let's schedule it. <laughs> Absolutely. So you want to talk, uh, we don't have much time left, but talk a little bit about fermentation. Uh, I know you do a lot of that. Yeah. So one of my, one of my primary directives is to seek a higher level of umame. And, you know, what is umame? Umame is a flavor, a uh, set of flavors that accentuates the depth of, of character. It's sort of, it's a hard thing to describe, but like fish sauce has umame because it adds depth, richness of flavor to whatever you add it to. A lot of people are scared to use fish sauce because it's, you know, you smell it right out of the jar, it's kind of strong. Mm -hmm. But you use a little bit in your dish, you don't taste fish, but you just wonder why the dish tastes better. It's because you're adding umami to it. And certain ingredients like mushrooms, they have natural umami. So mm. one of the things that is one, one of my primary objectives is to create, for example, the perfect vegan fish sauce. Because there's a lot of vegan fish sauces on the market, but they're not very good, really. So I'm in process of fermenting about 20 different things to use in different various combinations to seek to create the perfect vegan fish sauce. And one of those things is duckweed. I don't know if you know what duckweed is. Duckweed. It's all yes. over the bayou. Yeah, everywhere. I was going to say, yeah. it's all it's all out there in the brackish now, we water, have, we isn't it? We have quite a bit in it go away. Oh, you have it in, it's fresh water. I thought it was... Fresh and brackish. Okay, it's bright. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, so we have a bayou that, on the tiki farm. So one day I was, we were eating lunch, so I was just looking at the duckweed, watching the ducks eat it. So I just Googled it. I'm like, duckweed? Is that edible? Probably. And it is. It turns out it has up to 20% protein. So it's kind of like a superfood. So of course, then I ran down there and grabbed some duckweed and ate it. <laughs> right <off the> <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, it doesn't taste great, but yeah. it doesn't taste bad. And it tastes kind of seaweedy, you know, kind of like oceany. So I decided to grab a nice handful of it and put it into fermentation. So I did it a few different ways. I'm making one into a soy sauce, I'm making one into a miso, and I'm doing one in, a, in an amino ferment. And the difference between an amino ferment and a miso is really uh, soybeans. So an amino ferment uses koji, mm. uh, water, and salt to ferment something. A miso includes soybeans. So the traditional miso is koji, soybeans, salt, and water. And then, <clears throat> so if you don't use soybeans, it's called an amino ferment. And what you're doing is you're, you're breaking down uh, proteins into different component parts because proteins are made of change of amino acids. So amino acids are bound by peptide bonds. So when you use koji, it breaks peptide bonds and proteins. So it breaks your proteins down into shorter chains. So then when you cook whatever you fermented with koji, it caramelizes better because it essentially it takes sugars out of the meats and makes them accessible to cooking. So it creates more of the Maillard effect, right? We know the Maillard effect, it's caramelization, and caramelization mm. equals flavor. So what we're doing is we're seeking 
to pull the sugars out of the proteins to create caramelization when you cook it. So koji is the building block for making sake, soy sauce, and miso. But I use koji in marinades. You can take koji and turn it into what's called amazake, and amazake is an amazing marinade, which will allow you to act to break down the long protein chains to make your barbecue caramelize and taste better. Mm. Have you worked with kudzu? I've tried many <laughs> ways to, to eat kudzu, and I have failed every time. Yeah, kudzu is, is kind of a tough one, but the tips of kudzu are edible, and they're actually kind of delicious as a garnish. I've tried cooking them like greens or mixing them in with different greens, but they're just, You know, we could become millionaires or billionaires if we could find an edible use for for kudzu. We got plenty of it. Taming of the kudzu. Well, uh, we have to go now, but thanks so much for joining us. And tell our listeners where they can find you, follow you, uh, see your work uh, on the Internet and and such. Yes, absolutely. So we've got... um, The restaurant is uh, Sui Generous Nola on Instagram and Facebook. The food lab is www.tikifoodlab.com. And you can go on there and you can see if we have, we're going to release our spring series of of cooking classes and food experiences very soon. And then we've got our Instagram page for the farm is SG Tiki Farm on Instagram. Those are the best way to uh, to find them. And the restaurant? The restaurant in New Orleans. And the restaurant's open, you said, uh, Thursday, Friday? What were the days? Right now we're open Friday, Saturday, Sunday for dinner service only. It's a very small okay. schedule, which actually helps me be an attorney during the week, too. <laughs> and and it's located in the Bywater. What's the address? Where, where is it's it? It's 3219 Burgundy Street between oh, Piety and Louisiana. Okay. Terrific. Well, again, uh, I remind our listeners uh, that Chef Ernest and Carol Palmer will be – in Hancock County at the Performing Arts Center this Saturday morning for an event called Homegrown. It's it's cookbook authors, chefs. It's a writer's exchange. That's what they're calling it. That's what it is. Well, anyway, that is Saturday the 27th in Hancock County uh, featuring uh, Chef Ernest uh, and and Carol. Thank you so much, Chef. Uh, It was a delightful conversation, and we look forward to seeing you again soon, particularly when the cookbook comes out. My pleasure. I'd love to do it. Great. Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. We are funded by the generous contributions from folks like yourself, and we thank you. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. For our guest, Chef Ernest Fondas, my co-host Carol Palmer, I am Malcolm White. We ask that you now stay tuned for Marshall Ramsey's show. Now you're talking, followed by Southern Remedy at 11. And join us every Monday and every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for more Deep South Dining, heard right here exclusively on your MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.